It's been 30 years since I graduated high school, and here are 30 things that I would tell myself 30 years ago. And hello everybody, welcome to episode 23 of the Musician Toolkit. I'm your host, David Lane, and it is great to be with you once again. Well, it's that time of the year when high school seniors are getting ready for the big event, graduation. I remember this time vividly. I had just conducted the premiere of my first piece with large instrumentation performed by my high school concert band, and it was my final ever concert as a high schooler of any kind. Um, Getting that standing ovation, it just further validated my decision to become a music major. Uh, I then went on my very first trip to Washington, D.C., which was a a city that was a good bit further away uh, from where I lived then compared to where I am now. I played the piano for my baccalaureate and my graduation service. Um, And there there are so many memories from just around that time. And they're all from exactly 30 years ago. Most of the truly impactful changes in my life and my mindset, they actually occurred after the age of 30. And uh, when I began thinking about this, a post that I wanted to do kind of on, on these life lessons, I actually started off with a longer list of things than 30 uh, and dating back 20 years ago. But I did want to celebrate this happy time for so many of you uh, and so many of, you know, your family members that are graduating high school. Now, one of the least prophetic things told to me at the time that I graduated was you spent all of your time wishing that you could get away and you'll spend the rest of your life wishing you could get back in. um, This was someone who had been out of high school, I think, for about 10 years. Well... You know, I haven't seen that person since since I moved away from Florida. So, you know, I can't imagine that they'll, they'll even hear this, but but I would just say if you if if you did and you remember saying that, I would just say you were half right. I couldn't wait to graduate high school in 30 years. I have never wished even once that I could go back. I truly felt like my life was just finally beginning when I graduated, not ending. And it was in some ways that I expected, but quite a few that I didn't. Now, like any adult looking back on the past, there are lessons that I wish I could have learned the easy way, but I might not have appreciated them as much if I had. So this is going to be a very general episode. Some of these things apply to being a musician. Some of them, I think, apply to being anybody. Now, I want to be upfront. These are 30 things that I would tell myself 30 years ago, or I should say this to be more specific. These are 30 things that I would tell myself when I was graduating high school. These are not 30 things that I would tell you when you were graduating high school. There are 30 things on this list. I could have put more, but I I limited it to 30. And I'm going to say the mathematical odds of you not finding at least one of them that you agree with is going, is probably next to nothing. In the same way that all 30 of them applying to you is probably the same odds. You probably won't agree with all 30. But I think anything in between is quite likely. You may agree with just a few. You may agree with quite with, with most of them. But I think everybody should find at least something to take from this. But again, this is these are the lessons that I've learned that I apply to my life. Now, if you hear this episode and you have any any thoughts that come to mind, something you agree with or something you wish that you could you could add to this that you think might be applicable to to not just yourself but a lot of people or or even just something that was really important you you don't have to figure out whether it would be important to anybody else but it was really important to you uh, definitely let me know i would love it i would prefer you to send me a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash musician toolkit okay 
Well, let's get to the list. This is in no particular order. This is just the order things came to mind. So 30 things that I would tell myself 30 years ago. And the first one is to go all in with investing in yourself. There are a lot of ways that you can spend money aside from your basic needs. But when you're young and you're trying to build an income, it can seem like there's just so little left at times. So consequently, it's easy to look for the cheapest and the most free options when it comes to your needs. But don't do this. Get the best instrument that you can afford. Get a good computer with good gear. Oh, and I can't, I, I have to, I have to elaborate on that. So I was told by everybody, not just one or two teachers, but everybody, even people who working in the industry, I needed a Mac computer. And I just start, I'll just stop right there. <laughs> the, I, I was told a lot of things, but I, but I was told that I needed a Mac computer. Well, I was a lifelong Windows user. And uh, there's one reason that I was very reluctant to make the change. 30 years ago, a good Mac computer was much, much more expensive than a good PC. I tried to build a studio with PC and, you know, cutting corners as much as I could. And all I really did was delay getting any kind of traction in my career as a composer by at least 10 years. It wasn't until I finally got myself an Apple computer that I did any professional composing work, that I could even land any professional composing work since I had graduated college. I come from a, a family with a dad who really valued frugality, and I still, I still appreciate that lesson. But I didn't realize that when it comes to investing in your dream, in your career, this is a place that you cannot find, you can't cut corners. What you need to do is take more time to save and do it right. Don't go cheap. If you have to, if you have to, have to delay, if you have to take out a little bit of debt, you have to figure out what's best for your situation, but don't go cheap. So another thing in this category is get some lessons with a good teacher or advice from a good coach. If there's a $200 course or a piece of gear that will truly make your skills more advanced or your life easier, you should do it. For one thing, it gives you what's known as skin in the game. When you don't spend money on your tools and you just accept the, the free versions of apps with ads and you try to teach yourself everything, well, you don't really feel any pressure to stick with your goals. I think of how long, kind of just vaguely related to this, I, I think of how long I kept going with limited data plans or choosing phones with a low amount of storage and then strategically skimping to make it work. When really it was just a few dollars more each month. I have everything I need. I'm not cutting corners, doing online lessons, hoping that it you know, I get it in before the 40 minute mark and, and don't have to cut off and then come back on. Invest in yourself. If it's something you need, pay for it and then do the work to make it worth it. Now, the second thing I would tell myself is actually uh, probably should come first, but I wanted to get that first thing out of the way. You need to invest in yourself. But the second thing is you need to save money first. So I'm not saying to ignore my first bit of advice until you do this step but you should minimize it. In my 30 years of life since high school, my number one source of anxiety, and there really isn't a close second, it's been financial stress. A few years ago, I'm not going to say that I cured that stress, but I have all but eliminated that stress with a threefold system. First of all, I built an emergency fund that would cover at least six months of bare bones expenses. Now, it won't cover six months of me eating out all the time, uh, you know, or spending, you know, money to, to, to go to the movies or to go to some concerts or, or, or maybe even keep all of the streaming services that we have. I mean, I probably might have to cut some corners, but I could go six months and not worry about having enough to eat or, you know, keeping all of the utilities going or even getting around in my car. 
And the second thing that I did is I started budgeting for large expenses and buying only the things that I could afford either in full or mostly paid off already. Yeah, I think if you are investing in yourself, if you have to go, if you have to do a little bit of debt early on, if that's going to really make a difference, I don't think that that should be a factor in you not investing in yourself. I've reached a point in my life, though, where unless it is an extraordinary opportunity, I will not go into debt for it. I will save up. And, and the only thing that I really go into debt for right now is is a car and a house. If I was to get a new car or a new house. And I would try to minimize that by having as big of a down payment as possible. But anything else, I just, for me, it is much less stressful not to have debt. And the third thing I started to do is automating money towards retirement. Uh, this is something that I would absolutely tell myself 30 years ago. Don't wait until you've been out of high school or even out of college for a decade or more before you start saving money for retirement. I think right now, right this week, before you get a frame for your diploma, go to the bank and get yourself a Roth IRA or whatever you qualify for and pick just some simple, safe, conservative funds and start automating whatever you can afford, even if it's, I don't know, $10 a week, $20 a week, whatever you think that, that you can manage. Automate that so you don't ever have to think about it. It's money you don't even see. It goes straight to your retirement fund and watch the magic of compound interest. I just read a book called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, and he made a big point about Warren Buffett, about how he started investing, I think, when he was 15 or 16 or something like that. And, and it says if, if he had just done everything that he had done but started at the age of 30, instead of having 80-something billion dollars today, he would have, you know, maybe like just a few million. And, you know, if you, if you're like me a few years ago, you might, you might not realize how big of a difference that is, but it is, it's basically like a 99% difference. It's like he would have like 1% of the wealth that he has now, if he had just waited 10 or 12 years to get started. Don't wait, go ahead and start that off. I waited too long uh, it's unlikely I'm ever going to join the ranks of billionaires, but just getting those things going has meant a world of difference. I no longer panic when I have a few students quit within a short amount of time because it happens. It's not, re it's not necessarily reflective of me as a teacher, but people's lives, things come up. Uh, students move, students graduate. I teach adult students and sometimes the work schedule gets intense and I might go months with no change and then one or two months happens and I lose quite a few students. Well, I don't panic about that anymore. I don't panic when appliances quit. And just as a fun fact, in 2022, there was a seven month period in which our refrigerator, our stove and our dryer all quit. And this was right after voluntarily buying a new dishwasher. And at the same amount of time we had, between our two cars, we had over $3,500 of car repairs. And yet we were prepared. Money in the bank gives you freedom to be creative and to get you what you need. All right, the third thing that I, that I would tell myself 30 years ago, this is a very hard lesson and I feel like I'm still coming to grips with it. And every time I go on social media, I see, I see a colleague who struggles with this. So I think this is important for a lot of you. This is music related. Your friends don't have to also be your fans. So let me say that again. Your friends don't have to also be your fans. So I think every musician needs to learn this lesson the hard way. There's just no getting around the disappointment of doing a live gig and not seeing anybody you know in the audience, or posting something about your music on social media to your friends and just getting crickets. And you'll see your friends on, the, on that same social media who don't come to your shows, 
posting about all the other bands that they see in concert, including big name artists, where it costs probably uh, the same as seeing 20 of your shows. So it's okay. Your friends are not your friends because of your music. Most likely not. They might appreciate that about you, but, but they like your personality or your sense of humor or any number of factors. Your fans are the ones who get to know you because of your music. And they might know very little about you other than your music. Now, sometimes your friends become fans and you may meet fans who become friends, but you shouldn't expect them to be both. Allow your friends not to be your fans. Don't get disappointed when they're not liking your posts or they're not showing up to your concerts, when that's not how you establish that connection as a professional artist. This will allow you to cherish your friendships for what it is, but also cherish your fans for who they are. All right, the fourth thing that I'm going to say, it probably sounds like I'm giving this too late because the the advice would be to practice as much as possible before graduation. Uh, It's like, whoops, too late, you just graduated. No, I actually mean before you graduate everything, before you graduate college, before you, if you're going to go on to get your master's or your doctorate, before your final graduation, practice as much as you can. Unless you are one of the fortunate very few who can earn a great income from just performing and still designate large amounts of time to practice, you're going to find that this time that you have available greatly diminishes after you become a working professional musician. Until you get to that point, you need to treat your practice time like a part-time job until you get that last diploma. My musicianship is much more advanced than when I graduated with a master's degree. But my performance skills are only marginally better. What you accomplish on your instrument before you enter the real world, for most of you, will set the standard for much of your life. You can still improve, but you're going to find that harder without a job that allows you ample time. The fifth lesson is that consistency matters the most. Practice every day. Composers, write every day. Post something on social media related to your art or your business every day. It all adds up even small efforts. I can post 20 videos to Instagram, for example, and 15 might not do much of anything. And that leaves five. Three three do pretty well, and two do very well. If I keep that up for 100 days, I might end up with 10 videos that did pretty well. But the thing is, I don't know what or why I have that success until after it happens. It's not easily predictable. But what is predictable? Your effort. Show up daily. Number six is a lesson that I learned fairly recently. I would say I was probably uh, close to 40 when I learned it. And that is that you should be concerned with too few of failures rather than having too many. Again, just a few years ago, I was feeling like a loser after I lost out on an opportunity to score a film. And in my mind at the time, it it seemed like that getting rejected or fired has happened one time as well. It seemed like it was happening once or twice a month. And, And while I was lamenting, I somehow was able to make myself to just actually start counting. And I actually realized that In the past five years, I had only been rejected seven times. So that's hardly once or twice a month. It's barely once a year. And in that same span, I had successfully scored five short films. So it's nearly 50% of my attempts. And what I immediately realized was rejection not only hurts more when it happens too seldom, but taking too few of chances is ignoring the math of probabilities. You didn't make the cut on an orchestra audition? Well, audition for 20 more. A publisher didn't accept your piece that you composed? Try 30 more. I like to gamify my chances and see how quickly I can get to 100 failures. Now, the fact is, if you know your craft and you're working to improve... 
you're bound to accidentally find some significant excess on the way to allowing yourself to fail. All right, back to some general advice. Number seven. This is a lesson I don't think I've I don't think I've quite learned yet. I'm trying to get better. I would definitely tell myself this 30 years ago because maybe I would be doing better off now, but that is bad dietary choices add up. I used to think that I was blessed with great metabolism in my in my late teens and early 20s, but now I, I think it was more that I was cursed with it. Over a weekend in college, I could drink six or seven cans of soda, eat a whole family-sized bag of Doritos, have four fast food meals, and I could do that for more weekends than, than I didn't in, in a calendar year. And that was college, and I never gained a pound. Well, that was 25 years and 45 pounds ago. <laughs> I struggled with inflammation and other ailments that were probably caused by excess sugar, processed foods, also stress. I do eat better now, and I'm still, so far, cross my fingers, I still in pretty good health overall. But the bad choices that I made, food or otherwise, they, they add up. Indulging in a pizza is fine, but making it or the caloric equivalent your normal choice will add up in a way that it takes a lot of work to reverse. Number eight. And again, this is for me. This is advice I would tell myself. This is one that I think likely a lot of you might disagree with, but that's okay. And that is that I think that realism is best. Don't see the worst or the best outcomes of any situation. It's healthy to be a little bit skeptical. But it's also fine to be optimistic and positive in how you respond. But you need to accept each situation for what it is. In other words, if there's a recession... Don't shrug it off with the proclamation that it won't affect me. Also, don't, don't go into it expecting that you're going to lose everything. Accept the situation and calmly look at what it is that's within your control and plan accordingly. I'm a big fan of removing the words always and never from my vocabulary because the labels are almost always hyperbolic. Think in terms of probabilities. Some things are likely to happen. Some things are not very likely to happen. And there are so many shades of that in between. A really great book to introduce you to that way of thinking is called Thinking in Bets, Making Smart Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. And that's written by Annie Duke. Let's stay on this theme with number nine. Don't be surprised at what life throws your way. I'm genuinely puzzled by the response to any misfortune or tragedy of when, when people say, ask this question, what did they do to deserve that? Well, unless you're talking about a crime and the legal punishment, the answer is usually nothing. Life doesn't play favorites. Nature is as violent as it is beautiful. People are kind and they're also mean. The economy is great, but then sometimes it's not. People die young. Jobs get lost. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't grieve accordingly, but we're not being persecuted when it happens. I grew up in Florida where the most beautiful sunny day was likely to have a torrential thunderstorm around 3 p.m. that would last just for a few minutes. Storms come unexpectedly. Expect that anything you can't control is possible, and not all of it will be pleasant. Don't be surprised at what life throws your way. Number 10, you can be confident in yourself to handle any situation. Over the past several years, I've become an advocate of Stoic philosophy. And one of the things that it teaches is that the only indestructible freedom you have in life is how you choose to respond. Almost anything else can be taken away from you, but how you respond is always your choice. So when things come up, just know that you can handle it. It might take longer than you'd like, but you can see it through. You can do it. Number 11. This took me a long time. I would say it's only been the past, it's only been two years at the most, literally at the most, where, that, that this has been something that I have been able to learn. And I really wish I had known this when I graduated high school. Your dream career 
might only be a starting goal that gets detoured, and that's okay. It's hard to have a dream to invest in the education, often for many years, and then someday say that for whatever reason, you've changed your mind. I will encourage all of you if, you, if you don't know what sunk cost fallacy is, go look it up. You can find it on Wikipedia. You can find it on other websites. We all struggle with it. It's far easier to keep telling yourself that your break is coming. Keep dreaming the original dream. But I heard someone else say this, and it made me feel just so thankful that they shared this. Do you really think you know what's best for your life when you're 18 or 21, or 25, you will change your mind about a great many things in your life. And you'll realize how misinformed you were. I think I've done that on just about everything. <laughs> it's okay to pivot, and odds are you will use your experience to help your new direction. So it's not all for nothing. So I had a variation from a friend of mine who shared this, and she said, her advice was that not all careers are linear. Sometimes you'll move horizontally or even backwards to position yourself for future growth. Number 12, be accepting of people's different tastes because there aren't many happy elitists. I found myself in conversations in person as well as online where someone would rather tell you how much they don't like a movie how much they don't like a series or a book or a musician or a band or so on. Sometimes it's easy to find yourself not liking something and spending so much time making fun of someone who does like it or even thinking less of them. This happens with people who really love one genre of music. There are still classical fans on Twitter who call film, film composers hacks. There are so many chanters of the slogan, today's music sucks. Now, I'm not saying that you have to like everything, but why don't you allow others to like it without your judgment? Elitists struggle to find friends, except for the few like-minded people they can find. And that's a very narrow and very flimsy foundation for any kind of friendship. Number 13, such a hard lesson for me, but one that I'm glad that I eventually came to. Be early to adapt and let others moan about how wrong something is. When I got the first version of my website in 2005, which, which I think was very late for me, to be honest, I was, I was in college when email first came around. I had an older teacher colleague tell me that they were still convinced that the internet is just a fad. <laughs> now, in 2005, that seemed crazy to me, and it's only gotten crazier ever since. So I've never held that attitude, but I've often been late. If I had began a podcast when I first had the idea, instead of two to three years later, I would have been in a better position to succeed. Same thing comes to YouTube. There are people who moan about social media, while others are getting on right away and succeeding. Recently, it was TikTok, but, but soon there will be another big thing that, that you'll have some people who wait and see while early adapters are more likely to find success. Now, right now, as I'm recording this, it's AI. There are certain jobs, even within music, that are in danger because of AI. Are you going to be the type of person who sits around and complains about how unfair it is? Or are you going to accept it and start learning now how you can pivot to be more valuable in the present? In a similar vein, keep up with your software updates. Now, as more things go toward a subscription model, that's something you won't have to keep track of quite as much as you used to. But, but don't be the person who keeps their computer five years after it stopped updating its software. Updates usually benefit you and you're dealing with less than you need to by hanging on to outdated tools. Number 14, keep up with your friends. Write down 10, 15, or 20 friends that you genuinely care for, and go schedule some time with a reminder for you to text them, call them, 
try to have some lunch, just get together. It's hard to imagine this when you're 18 and you're around your friends all the time, but it's easy to let years, many years go by without even touching base. You can't keep up with everyone, but don't allow the relationships that matter to you to go dormant. Number 15, and I'll probably have another podcast episode just all about this in the future, but curiosity is a superpower. When you change your reaction from that's horrible to that's interesting and approach everything like a curious cat or a scientist, you're going to find that it's an antidote to stress. It's an antidote to anxiety and depression in a, in a majority of instances, not in all cases. But get excited about discovering new things. Curiosity is the engine behind every invention. It's the, it's the engine behind every great work of art, every scientific discovery, every great relationship, and so much more. Be curious and stay curious. Number 16 is a lesson that I actually alluded to already, but I'll say it again, be more specific. You might change your mind about everything, and that's okay. There's a trap that I had to overcome with my life, and that is allowing opinions to become part of my identity. People hold on to allegiance to a political party, for example, because they strongly identify as a member of that party rather than having a core set of values and being willing to go another direction if the party doesn't always align. Now, that's just an example. This is not that kind of podcast. But my advice would be to separate who you are and what you value from what you believe or the opinions that you hold. Always be willing to ask why you believe something. And if it doesn't hold up to your deepest core values, it's okay to change your mind. Number 17, my advice is to stay in touch with pop culture, at least a little. If someone raves over a movie or a TV show, it really doesn't take more than five minutes to go watch a trailer or to read a review or a blog. If there's a new song that everyone seems to love outside of your preferred genre, it, it wouldn't take much time to listen to it at least once. Stay connected to what's going on because it matters to some people that you know and it keeps you in the loop. Number 18, become an expert in marketing yourself. Nobody will get you work for yourself more than yourself. Learn why you love music and what you offer as an artist or an educator and learn how to share that with everyone. Learn how social media platforms work and share yourself, share your art, share your services. Number 19 is a bit of specific business advice. But if your rates never scare anyone away, you're not charging enough. This was a very hard lesson for me. In the past, I've actually heard uh, a prospect tell me that's a bit much. And then I backed down and I offered a discount. And then I lowered my rate for for the next client who asks, which is a double cringe. <laughs> There's actually a simple test. Take note of the next five people who ask for your services and ask what your rate is. If none of them flinch at your rate, then it's definitely too low. If they all accept, even reluctantly, it still might be a little bit low. I think out of five people, at least one or two should be scared off. Now, if more than 50% are scared off, you might be too high. But the right market value and the one that's going to allow you to make a good living as a professional musician, it won't be right for everyone. And it should be at least a little too expensive for some, but not all. Now, lesson number 20 is definitely me wanting to remind you that this is advice for me because I could, I could definitely see how some of you might take exception to this it, because this won't apply to everyone. But it, I have had the fortune to say that this can apply to me. And it's something that, that I would tell myself 30 years ago. And that is that you should solve money problems more through income than you do through expenses. 
Too often in my life, I've looked at how I can reduce expenses. As, as I mentioned under, under the first lesson here, I was talking about cell phones and it was 2014 before I got a smartphone plan. I used to get the least expensive prepaid phone plans with phones that were usually vastly inferior to the market standard. There's a fine line between cutting out what's necessary and the depressing steps of looking for ways to save a few dollars here and there. Now, you might have to reduce your expenses in times of emergency, but this should always be second to the goal of increasing your income. For every one hour that you spend auditing how you're spending your money and trying to save a few dollars here and there, spend three hours researching what you can do to improve your income or spend that time doing the work that will help you increase your income. This is the best way to solve money problems. Again, at least for me. Lesson 21 is short and simple, but very important. Don't take time off from physical fitness. You're going to get busy. You'll take breaks from things, but don't do that with exercise. Whether it's lifting weights, doing calisthenics, riding a bike, running, walking, swimming, just stay active. There will come a time where if you take a month off, it's going to feel like you've regressed by years when you come back to it. As you get older, this just becomes more and more true. So give yourself breaks when you get sick, but come back to a routine that you can sustain of staying active as often as you can. Lesson number 22, whenever absolutely possible, accept every invitation to socialize. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I still don't have this lesson down pat. I have violated that within the last month. This is a hard lesson for me, but it's one that I'm, de that I'm still determined to improve. I'm a lifelong introvert. And so therefore I've responded to many invitations of going out for a drink after the show or to a cast party or some other kind of party uh, with excuses that could easily be rescheduled. And, uh, and I've experienced the natural consequence of this. And that is that I don't get invited to things as much now as I used to. And I'm, and I'm sure that if I didn't take efforts to improve this, to show up every now and then, there's likely a time where people would just stop inviting me altogether. Every year I read research about how social interaction is actually maybe the most important thing that you as a human can do to improve your health. Social isolation is, is a bigger killer than diet. For some of us like me, being social is an effort. But socializing has a profound effect on human health. We are social animals, even us introverts. And people, people who avoid it struggle with depression more often than people who stay engaged. You might genuinely be tired. You might want to just go home. But if it's an option, say yes to those invitations. If you're really tired, you can go home a little early, but invest that time in, in socializing. Lesson number 23 is that you should want to be criticized by strangers. I know that sounds odd, but one of the things that, that keeps some people from putting their music or their videos or, or sharing their expertise out in the world where the public can comment is the fear of being disliked or criticized. Now, this fear could lead to you not sharing, but it could also lead to compromising your approach in the effort to be universally liked. Unfortunately, avoiding that dislike button on YouTube or some snarky comment on TikTok, it can only happen if you're not sharing or only your friends are seeing it. It's playing it safe. If enough people see anything, you're going to have people who don't like it and they want to let you know about it. Do you need proof? Do you think that somehow you have this this art that will transcend every everybody's opinion and no one could possibly dislike it. IMDB, the Internet Movie Database, it's a website where people can rate movies and and um, 
offer reviews, and find out more information about the movies. If you love something, you can rate it 10 stars. And if you hate it, you can give it one star and anything in between. So let's take two movies that you would probably think everybody likes. The Wizard of Oz and It's a Wonderful Life. For The Wizard of Oz, 5,386 people and counting so far have given it a one star. I hate it rating. And for It's a Wonderful Life, 6,794 people have given it one star rating. How about a a beloved book like The Little Prince? So many people have said, I love this book. It's my favorite. Well, how does it do on Goodreads? Which is a similar place where you can rate books from one star to five stars. With five star being that you love it and one being that you hate it. Yes, slightly more than 1 million people gave it the highest rating, but 33,567 readers and counting have given it just a one-star rating. These are the most beloved works of art. If you put yourself out there in the world, you're going to be criticized. Universal appeal is only possible in a very limited sphere, so if you're not being criticized by strangers, you're not reaching out to enough people. You're hiding. You're compromising. And as a, I don't think compromise would help. You're just hiding. You're not being seen by enough. So you getting criticized by strangers is a sign that you're getting out there in the world. Keep it up. Make that goal. Don't be mad at what they say. Just be happy. This is happening. Lesson number 24. This might be a tough one. But it's one that I think that's true, and that is that your attitude is a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think this might be the most controversial advice I can give. There are people all over the world who will tell you that your attitude is shaped by your circumstances. If, if you're poor, you struggle with physical and mental health. Or if you are just unlucky then you are understandable when you complain and have a negative view of of yourself or the world. If you're rich, or if you're in good health, or if you have a lot of friends, then you will naturally come across as joyful. There are others who will say that a joyful and positive attitude will leave you open for opportunities, perseverance, and cause you to be a, a magnet for collecting friendships, while... A woe-is-me or defeatist attitude invites more negative events in your life. Camp 1 says that your circumstances shape your attitudes. But Camp 2 says that your attitudes shape your circumstances. Well, I'm fully in Camp 2. At least I am now. I don't think I was when I was 18. And I feel confident for saying that for two reasons. So first of all, I've seen it in myself. I've been the woe is me person. Ask anybody who's been Facebook friends with me for even five years or longer. I think that the negative energy gives birth to negative matter, which then further makes you miserable. I decided not too long ago that I'm not going to let anything rattle me. But I'm going to expect the best of myself I'm going to expect the best of people, and even knowing that they'll sometimes disappoint. And I expect to be joyful and optimistic regardless of the situation. And what I've found is that good things happen more abundantly, and the moments of crisis are fewer. And it's largely because I'm now able to to see true crisis from just a difficult day. And the second reason is that I see it in others all the time. I see the person who is always lamenting their life and their life never gets better because it's like their thermostat is set to the setting of this stinks. Then there's the person who savors moments. They see the good in others. They're thankful for what they have rather than constantly complaining about what they don't have. And they just seem to attract more great opportunities and relationships. So set your emotional thermostat high And I'm willing to bet that your life will have more highs than lows. Lesson number 25. This will definitely be its own podcast episode down the road. Um, 
but you should constantly read books that improve who you are. I've read a ton of books over the years, and, and I've had my fill of science fiction, horror, thriller, and mystery novels, and there's nothing wrong with the diversionary fiction. But you need to take time for other types of books, such as classics, well-regarded literary fiction, but also nonfiction related to psychology, business, music, and other important aspects of your life. I find it very important to read good books on history because it, it gives me perspective. We, we, if you ever heard anybody say people today are acting more in this negative way than they used to, well, a good history book will cure you of that. Biographies of successful artists are also great. What you read will shape your life. And as an additional note, this is a lesson that I had to learn. Don't read fast just because you want to check it off and say that you read a certain number of books per year. I, I do like the website Goodreads, but more and more I think that the reading challenge is a bad thing. Reading a hundred books that you won't remember all of is not nearly as effective as reading 40 or 50 books that you really took time to absorb. So read as slow as, as needed. Take notes or make highlights. And if it's good, plan to reread it soon because that's where you'll really get more insight is when you read it again. Lesson number 26. You are what you do, not what you think or what you plan to do. I'll say that again. You are what you do. You're not what you think or what you plan to do. So this may be tough to hear, and it was very tough for me to learn. Because if you call yourself a composer, but you spend little to no time actually composing, then I hate to break it to you, but you're not a composer. You might envision yourself living as a composer, having a career in that area, and you might even love the idea of it, but it's just a fantasy. If you aren't living it with action, then you don't value it as much as you value something else. If you want to learn your instrument well, but you're not practicing often, then there's something that you value, such as self-esteem or comfort, more than you value becoming a great performer. You can apply this to each walk of life. If you're eating junk food, if you're not working out, if you spend an excessive amount of free time on social media or streaming series or films, you are saying that you value what that offers more than the alternatives. If your actions don't align with your thoughts, you need to dissect them closely to figure out why there is a disconnection. Number 27, except in times of financial emergency, never let a month go by without attending live music or theater. Much like accepting invitations to be social, you should support live music and theater as often as you can. So if budget is an issue, go, go to smaller and more local shows and perhaps trade it for another expense. So, you know, eating out fewer, fewer amount of times or something else you can kind of let go. Besides exercising the habit of being supportive, the live experience really can't be fully duplicated by consuming YouTube or TikTok or even listening on Spotify. Lesson number 28. If an opportunity is given where you feel slightly unsure, you should take it. To clarify, if you feel wholeheartedly confident against an opportunity, you probably should avoid it. But if you only accept opportunities when you already feel fully prepared, you're missing out on several opportunities. One is the chance for growth and also the chance to learn something new about yourself. Working with musical theater was a suggestion that was given to me in 1996 and I ignored it. And it wasn't until 13 years later I was urged to try it on a production that was desperately seeking a music director. I didn't know what I was doing, and I ended up starting a whole new chapter of my life. To be clear, not all such opportunities lead to fairy tale endings. I was offered the chance to play for a Broadway tour in 2021, 
and I was asked not to come back by the by the end of the rehearsal. I was uncomfortable going in, and it turned out to be for a good reason. I wasn't ready for it. And yet, I learned what the process was like. I learned exactly what I need to do to be prepared for the next time. I also learned, rather than having to wonder, that it wasn't something that I wanted to pursue any further than I did. I made an immediate pivot of my energy, and I've never regretted it. I, actually, I only regret the things I never tried. Lesson number 29 is related to some of the other things that I've shared already, but I thought it needed some elaboration. And that is that you should approach your life with general values rather than specific goals. As most good career coaches will tell you, the why is the most important part for you to figure out. For years, I thought seeking to be a film composer was essential to personal success, but I never asked why I liked it. So I started thinking about it. One of the reasons was pretty shallow. <laughs> I wanted to become a household name in that field and win an Oscar for that category. Once I realized that there was no value in that reason, I thought about what else captivated me. It was, it was collaboration and the chance for dramatic creativity. Well, I get that very same joy as an arranger for other writers' musicals. I get to take their baby and make it better. And I absolutely use all of my film scoring skills when I do. Don't think about what you want to do with your life. But spend more time thinking about why you want to do it. Because that why will lead you to places you've never dreamed, but the what could become a crutch. Do likewise with every decision. What kind of goals do you have that are general? Maybe it's to be a good friend. Maybe it's to be a positive example in lives that may be lacking. Maybe it's to create great art that affects people. Do you see how that opens doors and also clarifies whether any action you take is a good one or not? The 30th lesson and final one for now is to see the world as a poet. I saved this for last because I think it's one of my most recent revelations and one that I can credit the book The Daily Stoic for showing me. If you're spiritual, this may come more naturally, but even if you're not, go outside and, and don't play anything on your phone. No podcast, no audiobook, no music. Just appreciate the sound of the birds and the frogs and the dogs barking. Notice how light reflects off the tree. When you're looking at buildings, admire the angles in a variety of architecture. The next time you go on vacation, don't plan more than a few things in advance, but instead seek out things to do spontaneously. When you're in the shower, actually smell the soap. Allow yourself to be moved by music. Chew your food thoroughly and savor each bite. Life is worth living in these simple but profound moments that happen all the time and every day. Not the monumental achievements that are actually quite elusive. And again, that is my list. I feel like I left some things out, but that leaves opportunities for future podcast episodes what most resonated with you, and what would you add to this list that you think is an important lesson? You can send me a message, or you can share that in a voice message at speakpipe.com slash musician toolkit. If you're on YouTube, please like this episode and subscribe for more content. And if you were following on a podcast, and if you found this on a podcast app, please follow and uh, if you feel so inclined, I would love it if you'd give it a five-star rating and review. And regardless, it really helps most of all if you share this episode with at least one other person. Finally, if you have a private studio of any kind, please check out the free trial of Fonz and see how that can save you time and energy in your admin work with scheduling and billing. You can find that link in my show notes. 
And that will wrap up this episode. Congratulations to all graduates out there, whether it's high school, college, or graduate school. Best wishes on the next stage of your life. And I hope that some of these lessons that you heard today can be some that you can go ahead and start trying right now instead of having to learn things the hard way and and get a head start on where you could be otherwise. Again, that's it for today. I'll be back with you with a fun episode next week.